So there's just a couple more announcements before I start today. So we didn't have our Ash Wednesday service last Wednesday, last Wednesday, because of the weather. That kind of dicey up here. <laughs> but it does do that. We know that it gets kind of dicey up here on the hill. So it's going to be tonight at 5 p.m. And then Christine Leahy, who usually plays the piano, um, is beginning a sensible shoe study at her apartment. And it's going to start this Tuesday at 1 o'clock. So if you have any questions about it, please um, ask me since Christine isn't here today. This morning, we're going to do something a little bit different. Because I think you might remember that I like different. Each of you will be a part of a beautiful story. The story of love, forgiveness, redemption. It's a story that Luke wrote in his gospel. You are taking a trip back to first century Maine, which is a small village, an Arab village, eight miles southeast of Nazareth. You have heard about a man named Jesus, who's been performing many miracles, such as he healed a centurion soldier's servant, he raised a widow's son from the dead, and you had also heard from other people that he had visitors from John the Baptist, um, a couple of his followers, who came to ask him, are you really the Messiah? That's a good sermon, but we won't get into the details of that today. Well, while all this was going on, of course, the Pharisees were following Christ by then. They were wanting to know who this person was. So there was, in, in Maine, there was a Pharisee named Simon, who decided to invite Jesus to an elaborate celebration that he wanted to host. But before you witness this celebration, let's kind of go back, like, the day of, earlier that day before the celebration, and see what's going on with a certain young woman. <clears throat> There was a young woman who lives in Maine, and she had just awakened and is contemplating her day. She gets up, she probably has breakfast, she gets herself dressed, maybe she cleans her house. But today is market day, so she knows that she has to gather her basket and head out the door. Now, if this was any other day in her life, she would have hated going to market. But today is a different day for her. She didn't notice the whisperings as she walked by or the stares that she was getting. She was different. She had just come back from listening to a man called Jesus who preached living words to her, and she will never be the same again. She may have been a part of the crowd of the 3,000 who heard Jesus preach and heard him say, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. After the crowd was leaving, she had tried to reach Jesus, but it was just too hard to get to him, because she really wanted to thank him for changing her life. So she reaches the market, and hears some of the people talking excitedly, about a celebration that Simon the Pharisee is giving that night. His special guest is Jesus. She stops dead in her tracks. Did she really hear that Jesus would be here in her village tonight? She had to be there. She must go. No matter what the cost, she would be there and thank the man who changed her life. And this leads us to our story today. It begins in Luke 7. Chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. And when you find that, and if you are able, I can find it, please stand as we read through the passage. And while we're reading this passage, I encourage you to think about these questions. Who do you see in this passage? Are you like the sinful woman? Or are you like Simon the Pharisee? One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. Now he keep in Jesus. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster basket of ointment. 
and standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment, with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had confided him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is, who was touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, before I continue with this message, some of you might be shocked at what I'm about to tell you. And some of you may already know what I'm about to tell you. But don't shoot the messenger. So I believe there needs to be some clarifying, excuse me, about our passage today. It was eye-opening to me because I had heard different stories of who this woman was. So many scholars and theologians have tried to answer the question, who is the woman in this story? The passage in Luke is not the same stories as we read in Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14, and John 12. These are different foot washings, which were done by different women at a much earlier time in Jesus' ministry. Also, in Matthew and Mark, Simon is a lover. And of course, that was not a prerequisite for anybody who was a Pharisee. And John also states the scene took place in Bethany, and Mary is not the woman in question in Luke's story. We're not really sure of the identity of this woman, but you know who it is? God is. And we may not know until we reach heaven. When we read the Gospel of Luke, we find that he wrote a lot about those on the fringe of society, the overlooked, the poor, the broken, which fits with his career as a physician and the compassion and tenderness Jesus had for women. I read this in a new version devotional. And I quote, a woman in Jesus' day was invisible. When she was outside, no man could speak to her. When a woman went to temple, she was forbidden to participate in the service. She could only observe. She could not receive an inheritance or be taught to read, and her opinions never mattered. End quote. But Jesus broke those chains and welcomed the women of his day to follow him as he continues to do today. So even so, Luke, even though Luke had never met Jesus, and he did rely heavily on the writings of Mark, he was able to understand the person of Jesus as our restorer and healer of those who were broken. And he was also able to confront those who thought they were without sin. Brother Rory states this about Luke, and I quote, Luke is blown away by the Lord's compassion to be willing to save the worst and the most undeserving among us. But he has no problem revealing just how far the self-righteous, such as Simon, are from salvation as well. So if you look back over the preceding chapters of Luke, excuse me, you're going to find that Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, and we, we heard about that last week in Pastor Janae's sermon. 
He also called his 12 disciples. He talks about loving your enemies and judging others. In the preceding verses of Luke chapter 7, verse 34, Jesus reiterates what is being said about him. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So all these things are being noticed by the Pharisees, the Jewish Pharisees. And this is where our story begins. So I want you to all, you're all going to be like a part of this story. I want you to imagine that you're actually there witnessing all this that happens. So as you're sitting there, reclining at your table, I want you to ask this question. Who do you see? So please keep in mind there are three players in this story. There's Simon the Pharisee, there's the unexpected guest, and Jesus. Someday I will not have to use my nose. <laughs> so you arrive at the formal dinner party. And it's going great. You still can't believe that you were even invited. The discussions begin to break out with this respected teacher, and you're just soaking it all in. Your attention turns to Simon, and you wonder if he is one of those curious Pharisees. Does he want to put Jesus on the spot? Is that why he invited him to be a special guest at the dinner party? Being a Pharisee, Simon may not have a pure agenda in asking Jesus to be the important guest at this party. So as you're looking around, as you're looking around at all that is going on, you notice how Jesus is sitting at the table. Why is it so important to tell us how Jesus is sitting at the table? You realize the room is set up like a Greek symposium. The room is large and opens out into the street. There are wandering musicians, jugglers, and acrobats entertaining the guests. So you turn to one of your friends, and you ask them to explain the seating in the home. In a rich person's house, there was a semi-private area of the house. There was a section for the public to stand on the street and look in, and observe everything being said and done. A respected host such as Simon would invite several of his socially upper crust friends to have dinner with an important guest, such as Jesus, who is an up-and-coming rabbi. These guests would recline along the table, lying down on their sides to eat. The conversations would be around topics which were of interest to the guests. In this case, Jesus. So as you continue to look around and observe your surroundings, you can hear the guests asking Jesus all kinds of theological questions. Suddenly a woman bursts into the scene. Gasps are heard. People are muttering to one another. How dare she? Who does she think she is? Since the room was open at one end, you realize it is easy to understand how she was able to enter the gathering. Now remember, this woman had thought about in our imaginational story, not getting to Jesus. So she was probably already part of the crowd that is waiting outside looking in. And she was waiting for the right moment to disrupt this party. Also remember the young woman knew it was important, it was important even though she was risking her reputation even more to crash this party. Whatever were the circumstances, as a result, she believed him to be the Messiah. Because Jesus had his back to her and was in a reclining position at the table, it was easy for her to begin washing his feet and anointing them with the expensive perfume. From the whispers, you know that everyone there knew of her reputation or had heard the rumors. You think to yourself, what would I have done in this situation? What do I think about the teacher who just let this woman anoint his feet? What do I think about the woman? How else would I expect this up and coming teacher to respond? So when she let down her hair, it was no surprise to anyone. Now, in first century Jewish culture, women were only allowed to let their hair down in the privacy of their bedrooms. When they were in public, they had to keep their hair covered. By today's standards, a woman uncovering her hair is just like a woman going topless in public. However, in first century, century Mediterranean culture, as compared to Jewish culture, Women would behave in this manner due to grief and would not be seen as being sensual at all. How we can be guilty of judging by appearances. As she begins to wash his feet with her hair, you hear the gasps and the mutterings becoming even louder because, according to her audience, she was performing a very sensuous act. But during this whole scene, you also notice the woman was crying so much that it was her tears that were washing Jesus' feet. She then anoints him with an exceedingly rare and expensive perfume. The cost of the perfume or the ridicule that she was experiencing was of no importance to her. 
So he asked me, why is she doing this? What caused her desperation? Who do you see? So in verse 39, we see Simon's reaction to this whole scene. Here is an important Pharisee, which just had his dinner party, disrupted by a woman, and a sinful woman at that. Instead of speaking his mind, he begins to think to himself, how can Jesus be a prophet and let this woman do this to him? Does he not realize who's touching him? So in other words, Simon's thinking, ah, I thought I caught him. My plans to shed true light on the so-called prophet has been revealed. But Jesus does know Simon's thoughts, as we see in verse 40. Jesus has unique insight into people's hearts, as he states in Luke chapter 12, when the Pharisees were closing in on him. He knows what Simon is really thinking, as well as the woman's pur purpose was in being here, disrupting a dinner party in a most unworthy manner. So Jesus now turns to Simon and says, Simon, I have something to tell you. The commentary in the Wesleyan tradition states, the most notable moments in life are those in which Jesus turns in personal conversation to an individual and deals with the conditions of his heart. So Simon responds, I say, tell me, teacher. So Jesus begins to share the parable about a money lender who forgives both of his debtors, one who owed a lot and one who owed little. Michael Card, in his book, Luke, the Gospel of Amazement, has this to say about the parable. And I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Carr. He's also a musician. I didn't really know that he wrote books until Pastor Janae learned this book. Jesus' brilliant parable is only two verses long. Yet it can stand alone as a work of literary art. But what we see in the frame Luke alone provides, it leads to another quantum level. The woman is the great debtor, and Simon is the one who owed Jesus, or owed less. Jesus is also telling us that there is no important, there's no little sin or big sin, and it's no matter if you're of high importance or of low importance. The debtors had nothing to pay. In comparison to the woman, but in comparison to the woman, Simon didn't see himself as a sinner. Who do you see? So let's stop and think a minute. So what about Simon? Did he realize that he also needed a Savior? We can see that the parable Jesus told was for Simon. The story doesn't go into any specific details on what happened to Simon. However, <coughs> when he responded to Jesus' question, Simon, I have something to tell you. Simon replies, tell me, teacher. So Michael Gardner again describes what may have happened to Simon as he listened to the parable. <coughs> Simon discovers that he is hearing the story of his own life. The gentleness of Jesus' story leads the Pharisee, like a lost sheep, to a place of understanding he would never have reached otherwise. How could he have known that the simple exchange that began with the words, I have something to tell you, would end with the promise of a new life? The parable reveals that Simon has the answer in his head. The parable also makes it possible for the answer to move to his heart. And like I said earlier, we still don't really know much about Simon and his decision. But we do know that in this story, Luke is showing us a side of Jesus who is for the hurting and the marginalized by society. When Jesus turns to Simon in verse 44 and asks him, Do you see this woman? Jesus is asking me and each one of us here today to really look around and see those who are seeking love and forgiveness. I see them the way Jesus does. Luke wants us to become a part of the story and ask ourselves, who do we see? We come to verse 44. And you see Jesus turn to the woman and say to Simon, you see this woman. Now what's really interesting here is that Jesus is turning Simon's thoughts around on him. But let's stop and take a little bit of a side road here. I look at the word see. I think we sang about see this morning. We all know what we see with our eyes when we observe our surroundings. But going beyond the physical sense, we also see with our emotions. We see by becoming aware of our feelings and the feelings of those around us. I believe this is why Jesus asked Simon that question. He wanted him to look beyond the physical 
and see her emotionally and spiritually too. Jesus didn't see a sinful woman, but someone with so much faith in the one who had set her free and was now showering him with her love. So back to the story. Jesus begins to compare his treatment to Simon, for Simon since he entered the party. And Jesus turns to the woman, but he's talking to Simon who's sitting behind him. They kind of wonder what Simon is feeling. I don't know if anybody's ever done that to you. Talk to somebody else, but he's really talking to you. <coughs> he turns his back on you. How would you feel if that's ever happened? And yet Jesus is allowing this woman, who is a sinner, to continue touching his feet. So Jesus is now listening off what Simon did not do in comparison to what the woman has been doing. So you have heard, <coughs> excuse me, dating back to Abraham, it was customary to leave a basin by the door so a servant could wash the visitor's dusty feet. But Jesus' feet had been neglected, and yet this woman was showering his feet with her tears. Rosenberg, that it was customary to greet a guest with a kiss of welcome, which Simon also failed to do. <coughs> but she continued to kiss his feet. The kiss of <coughs> welcoming back then is the same way as when we shake hands today. In verse 45, Jesus said, You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. It was also considered a righteous act to anoint someone, which also had been overlooked by Simon. But the sinner had anointed his feet with perfume. Charles Spurgeon states, Oh, for more of this love. If I might only pray one prayer this morning, I think it should be that the flaming torch of love brought into brought into every one of our, every one of our hearts, and that all our passions should be set ablaze with love to him. So you've been watching this woman selflessly do all these things to Jesus. You saw how she dried his feet with her hair, and the hair is considered the most glorious part of a woman's body. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 11. This woman was worshiping Jesus at a great cost to her. It didn't matter to her the dirty looks or the horrible comments being made around her. Her desire to worship Jesus outweighed her fear of the guests. She didn't notice anyone or anything other than her Savior. She abased herself without caring what others felt. She only cared to pour out her gratitude to the one who knew her and saw her. Who do you see? In verse 37, you hear Jesus say to Simon, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. I don't know why you said ouch. This is really getting heated, this conversation. And you wonder, when did she receive forgiveness? So if you think back to our school story that we had, she may have been among the 3,000. I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm going to be moving here. Oh, thank you very much. Actually, I prayed it because I was looking at my, my bag earlier to see if I had any of my lozenges. I said, oh, please, let's have a lozenge. Because I knew this was going to happen. Thank you. You're welcome. So we originally thought that he was, she was among the 3,000 that had heard Jesus preach that that day. Do mm-hmm. you remember when the woman washed Jesus' feet with her tears and anointed them with a perfume? Mm-hmm. This was her act of contrition. She was remorseful and repenting in her own way regarding her past sins. She was doing this publicly, despite what people thought. It's important to remember that repentance and confession are a precondition to forgiveness. And that's what she did. She repented and confessed. So now you see Jesus turn to the woman and say to her, your sins are forgiven. Haven't we all heard that? I hope we have. You're among those sitting at the tables asking each other, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now we could discuss the contrast of how the woman was forgiven, like arguing which came first, the chicken or the egg. 
was that her face which saves her or her love. So I did a lot of reading on this, and I, this is my this is my take and my what I think it is. Yes, you can't have one without the other. But what's important to notice is that her sins are forgiven, and her oppression is lifted, and a life of peace finally comes to a sinful woman liberated from her past. So we're going to just recap the story a little bit. So you come in and you see a, you see a table full of the tastiest smorgasbord, smorgasbord of foods that money can afford. Jesus comes in and joins everyone who is reclining. There's laughing and much conversation to be heard. Suddenly a woman bursts down on the scene, rushes over to Jesus like she knew that he would be there, and begins weeping as she drops to the floor at his feet. Her hair falls loosely around her face and body, and she begins to wipe his feet with her loosened hair, which has become wet with her tears. Now, they had very thick, long, dark hair. This woman was weeping. I mean, this was like a rain shower coming from her eyes. She has in her hands an alabaster cruise filled with exotic-smelling perfume, which she begins to anoint his feet in exuberance and passion. Simon becomes increasingly agitated as she continues with a sinful display. He's also frustrated with Jesus because he is fine with her touching him in such a provocative way. Jesus knows exactly what Simon is thinking, and he asks him, Simon, do you see this woman? Everything Simon had planned, his agenda, had shifted to the woman and to himself. And what we hear is Jesus asking us, do we see ourselves? Do we see others? like I do, like Jesus does. Maybe there are some of you here this morning who you see yourself as this woman. Oh, this includes the men too. We feel on the fringe, forgotten. Maybe by the world or some self-righteous church attenders. I've labeled you due to your past, just like the woman in our story. Or you see yourself as Simon, self-righteous and judgmental Pharisee. Either way, you are broken and lost. You know you're a sinner, as the woman, and you know why you wear the label. And those memories haunt you. You have no hope, and you don't know where to turn. But that woman knew, and so can you. She fell at the feet of the one person who knew her and loved her the most. The one person who she could really trust. So my challenge for each one of you this morning, as we enter the season of Lent, is will you choose to fall at the feet of Jesus and worship him with gratitude and love? Will you take a long, hard look at yourself in the mirror and see Simon staring back at you? Will you beg for his undeserved forgiveness because you truly know just how your sin is unforgivable to a holy God? Everybody in here could probably testify that we were once hurt and marginalized. And if we are honest with ourselves, we could probably say that we were a little bit self-righteous. Judgmental. But we looked at Jesus when he looked at us, and we knew he really saw us, loved us, and when we, we repented and asked for his undeserved forgiveness, he lifted us, lifted us up and forgave us. Now we have a story of love, forgiveness, and redemption to share with those who are hurting around us. Robert Stein wrote in his book, The Method and Message of Jesus' Teaching. It is because of being loved by God and being forgiven of her sins, that woman now possessed a new attitude of love, stemming out of gratitude toward God. In a comparable way, it's because God has forgiven the believer that he or she is now able to forgive others. It is because God has been gracious and merciful to us that we have a heart of gratitude toward God and compassion toward others. It is because God bless us that we love others. It is because God has been merciful and dealt with us in grace that we now seek to fulfill the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So I'd like to leave you with a story that I found. It's really a really good story by Stephen Cole. <coughs> and he says, years ago, I knew a man named Glenn, who had been doing five years to life in a in Kentucky prison for drug dealing and other charges. One night, in the emptiness of his soul, he wandered into the prison chapel, where he heard the good news that Jesus Christ saved sinners. There, as he later learned at the same moment, that his mother was at home, on her knees praying for her wayward son. Glenn got down on his knees and received Jesus Christ as Savior. His life dramatically transformed from that moment. 
Not putting Lynn's heart, the burning desire to tell everyone, he, he met a Christ love for sinners. Everyone. One summer night, he and I walked along the boardwalk in Steel Beach, California. We could hardly carry on the conversation because every time we passed someone, Glenn would stop him to tell him about Christ. Another time, I was sitting in a restaurant where Glenn spotted me across the room. He loudly called out, Praise the Lord, Brother Steve. Then, since he had everyone's attention, he stopped at each booth on the way to where I was to announce, to where I was, to announce. Jesus Christ saved me from prison and from sin. Here, read this. He would have each person a gospel tract. Glenn had a gift to be able to talk to people about Jesus. However, he has something that we all need. A fervent love. A fervent love. I like that word fervent. A fervent love for Jesus. The woman that we heard about today didn't care what anyone thought and showed her fervent love for the one who changed her life. So when we hear the Holy Spirit whisper to us and ask us, who do you see when you look in the mirror? Or as you are out in the world, who do you see around you? What will your response be? How can you show your fervent love for Jesus and for others? Let's pray. Father God, we humbly come before a holy God. God, give us eyes to see those around us who are hurting. Not just in the world, but in the church as well. Help us to be restorers and reconcilers. Help them to come back to you. Each one of us can honestly say that we were away from God that we were away from you. But God, you sent your son Jesus to take on the sins of the world, sins that we were supposed to be martyred, be murdered for. And we thank you for that, Lord. Give us fervent love. A fervent love for, for, for you and for others. Give us a passion for others to know to know you, Lord. Help us to remember our stories and how we came to know you, Lord. That we can share it with others. Help us, Lord, to glorify you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the worship team is going to come up and sing, and I have a benediction.